Then I call the July 14th, 2020 meeting of the Carlington School District Board of Directors to order. Let's start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll turn off my video and stand up and we can do the pledge. I pledge of allegiance, pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, of America. America. and to the, to the republic, republic for which it stands, for which it stands. One, one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. <laughs> play ball. Yes, play ball. Thank you. Uh, will the secretary please call the roll? You're, you're on mute, Michelle. Director Honchire. Here. Director Frank. Here. Director Apple. Here. Director Russo. Here. Director Zaletsky. Here. Director Simsik. Here. Director O'Brien. Here. Director Mendoza. I'm here. And Director Shriver. Here. So um, normally we have a time at the beginning of our meeting where we invite the public to comment on any agenda items for this evening. Um, we're going to make a slight modification because uh, our superintendent's gonna talk about our school returning to school plans, and I would imagine a lot of the comments and questions might come off of that. So if we can move that section to just after the superintendent's report, so that will give Dr. Kreider a chance to share our thinking and share our plans, and then you have the ability to ask questions um, and comment on that. I think that would be appropriate. So we'll, we'll bypass the public comment for a few minutes. Um, I guess if I move to, uh, to the minutes then, uh, moving on to the approving the minutes for the meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you, Jude. Uh, and I apologize. Uh, approving the minutes for the June 30th, 2020 meeting. I was scrambling to get my screen aligned to, to read it properly. So thank you, Jude. Motion that I heard a second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carried, thank you. Um, I will report that we had an executive session prior to this meeting um, where we discussed personnel and litigation and negotiations. And I'll also report that we will have a continuation of that meeting or a, another executive session after this meeting and we'll report on that more fully at our next meeting. Now turning to Dr. Crater for a superintendent report. And thank you, Mr. Shriver. Uh, this evening, what we would like to do is present our health and safety plan that we have designed over the past few weeks. As all of you recognize the past few weeks and past few months have certainly created challenges on many school districts. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education has uh, required all school districts to develop a health and safety plan that is designed to transition students back into, into the classroom. And I'm sorry. Technology is a wonderful thing. Yes, it is. One moment, please. Okay, my screen is shared again now. We're good. Okay. 
Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education has uh, given us the duty to develop a health and safety plan to transition our students back into the schoolhouse as safely as possible. Uh, we have worked with a variety of uh, constituents to develop this plan. And as many of you have recognized, the plan itself is designed uh, to cover the major tenants that have been provided by Pennsylvania Department of Education. We've taken into consideration much of the information that we have received from Pennsylvania Department of Education, from the CDC, also local health professionals, as well as the Allegheny County Health Network. The state requirements require us to have a pandemic coordinator and team. Uh, the designated panelist uh, pandemic coordinator is myself, where I will serve as the, as the coordinator. We also assembled a team that was comprised of parents, teachers, board members, and administrators that as this plan was developed, used this group as a sounding board for feedback and information to develop the plan. As we move through the plan, we have a pandemic crisis team, which is designed to make decisions very quickly in the event we would have any very specific issues during the uh, school day, if a, if a staff member would become ill, if a student would become ill, that this is a group of individuals who respond very quickly uh, to situations that require quick decisions. Uh, we are also in the process of developing subcommittees. As you reviewed the uh, plan itself, you may have seen that it was overarching and rather uh, from more of a, a higher level view. We're developing specific outlines to each of the indicators that we have developed in our plan as well. Uh, and to give more information to what that looks like when it reaches the, the school level. As we take a look at the health and safety plan, uh, the way the state gave us, it's supposed to be designed in terms of green, yellow, and red. What many of us have recognized recently is the state has moved away from that labeling system of green, yellow, and red. And as we remain in the green level, uh, there have been restrictions that have been continued to put in place that have moved us back to uh, what would appear to be in many cases restrictions that would take us to uh, what we experienced in, in a yellow phase. Uh, the plan must be board approved, placed on the website, and then ultimately is submitted to the Department of Education. Other considerations that we took into place was that Act 13 of 2020 provided relief for the required 180 days. That act did expire on June 30th of 2020. However, new guidance has been provided by PDE as we move through this process and we develop our plan. Resources we used, again, Pennsylvania Department of Education, CDC guidelines. We also took into consideration a study by the Regional Education Laboratory and Mid-Atlantic Mathematica report. The key findings from that report are listed here, and it did recognize it that uh, many of us uh, recognized as well is that the school closure certainly had a direct impact on the learning and the social emotional well-being of our students. We rewind back to March, we were put in a very difficult position. We came up with a plan that quickly put into place uh, online learning. Uh, that as we move forward, the remote learning and online learning venues that we create will look much different than what they previously looked back in, in March. Um, the plan uh, must have some balance and also have public health safety taken into consideration findings that asynchronous instruction is not as effective as a face-to-face -face or synchronous. Um, and face-to-face -face or synchronous can exist uh, in an online environment as well. Children are less likely to be uh, infected by this disease and they are less likely to transmit the virus with some of the findings. And the school should, re should prepare for a reduced number of students uh, in the building. Masks uh, help mitigate the spread and transition that ventilation and sanitation help uh, mitigate the spread as well. And that as, as plans are designed, we wanna take a look at uh, flexibility that provides districts with the ability to move very quickly between different types of models of, of education. Um, they also did an agent-based model prediction, which took six or seven different models, ranging anywhere from putting students into, into schoolhouses without any safety precautions in place, the whole way up to adding in more layers of uh, safety precautions up to the hybrid level where students would report um, in cohorts of groups of one fifth. Th what that finding indicated is that the least amount of spread when having students report in a face-to-face -face environment is through the hybrid approach. 
Uh, we've also used the Allegheny County Health Department. They are planning when they work with businesses, they work with restaurants, they are making plans one to two weeks out and providing guidance there. Uh, our challenge is that we are working with uh, a trajectory here of close to five to six weeks away from school actually starting. However, tonight we do wanna make sure that we provide our parents and our families and teachers and students with some guidance and advance notice as far as where the district is planning to go. We also issued a survey back on uh, June 12th. And as we, that time we were transitioning to, uh, into the green level. And as we look at some of those survey results, I think many of us would agree that much of that information may be outdated and not as useful as it would be today. State guidelines, as mentioned before, the red, yellow, and green phase. Um, if we're in the red phase, we are required to use remote instruction. During the yellow phase, we are permitted to have face-to-face, -face, uh, which we would be able to. And in the green phase also allows for face-to-face -face instruction as well. However, at this time, there's no clear guidance from the state that transition us between green, yellow, and red phases. When we take a look at the models of instruction, when it starts to look at, at, the, uh, at the local level, uh, we had indicated we have remote learning model, we have a hybrid model, and then we also have a traditional model. Regardless of the model that, uh, that we use throughout the course of the school year, remote learning will be available to all students at all times. When in the remote uh, learning model, must be used in the red phase. Hybrid, as I mentioned, could be used in the green, and traditional also only used in the, in the green phase. Looking at what that looks like for Carlinton then, uh, the remote model, as I mentioned before, going back to March, April, and May, uh, our remote learning plans will look much different coming up this school year. We plan to have all students be issued a laptop. In the spring, we made sure that each household had a laptop. Now we are going to be committed to each student will be issued a laptop at the beginning of the school year. We will have live interaction between teachers and students, very similar to the types of interactions that we're able to have here. Uh, we'll be even uh, more available to students as well, either in a Google Classroom or in a Zoom setting as well. To have those personal interactions with your teachers from the student perspective is very valuable, uh, whether it takes place in a classroom or whether it takes place in a virtual setting. We will also have scheduled time for students report to their classes. So if a student, for example, would have their math class first period, English second period, family consumer science third period, there would be time frames that will be set up so that teach or students will log in at certain times where they will have that face-to-face -face interaction with their students and teachers uh, during those specific times. Notes, videos, and lessons will be updated on a daily basis, creating a much more dynamic and much more robust uh, online delivery system than what we saw in the spring. Looking at the hybrid model, if we'd move to a hybrid model throughout the school year, we look to have two groups of students as far as cohorts. We would look to have students report on Monday and Thursday, and we would look to have a second group report on Tuesday and Thursday. That creates a time in the middle of the week on Wednesday where all students would be uh, learning in that same format that was described above with that remote learning aspect. Uh, and then also on off days, Students would be learning at home using remote learning, working from folders that were previously set up by teachers uh, that again would be uh, much greater. While in the, in the classroom, we can maintain, because we would only be working with half of our students, we can maintain a six foot physical di distance uh, between students. And what this plan also provides for is additional time in the middle of the week and at the end of the week for cleaning uh, to create a more safer environment. The research that we saw also uh, in regard to masks, in regard to hygiene and cleaning, those are uh, crucial elements to creating a safer environment for our students and, and for our staff. The traditional model, traditional model is where we have 100% of our students report back to, to school on a daily basis. Uh, students would attend classes every day. When we look across our different buildings and our different classrooms and setups, we cannot achieve a six foot distance in all of our areas on a consistent basis. There are some classrooms where we have lower numbers of students where six feet can be achieved. However, if we have 100% of our students back in the building, there are some spaces where we can get a minimum of three feet uh, between 
between each of the individuals in a classroom. We also issued the survey uh, to families back on June 12th. That data, as I mentioned, is close to three weeks old, um, but we did hear from 612 uh, responses representing a total of 876 uh, students. So I'd like to pause it at this point as we look at, at those uh, three models that are uh, presented. Carlington School District, as, as we met, we would like to provide our parents and our families and our teachers with adequate time to prepare for uh, the instructional model that we, that we plan to roll out. What we have decided is we have decided to begin the school year with the remote learning model. What that means is we are committed to starting off in a remote learning model. We will continue in that model for a period of time of approximately four and a half weeks up to the, the midway point through the first marking period. What is very important for all of us to understand is that this decision is being made in the best interest of our students and our community and our staff, taking into consideration the local cases uh, that have spiked here in Allegheny County. And it provides us that opportunity uh, to get into the remote learning environment, get back into, into uh, the learning phases, um, and creates the opportunity for us to review the local conditions prior to moving on to the next step. Um, as we look at, at these phases, we would start in the remote learning model, evaluate in the first four and a half weeks, and then continue to make decisions to further examine whether we would move to a hybrid level, and then eventually move into a traditional model. Each of these steps, as we look at the guidance that has been provided to us, the remote learning model creates the most safest environment for our staff and for our students. The hybrid model is next in line as far as being able to create that face-to-face -face interaction. And the traditional model, right currently, right now, is the highest risk model that is provided to us. If we take a look back over the, from uh, the, survey that was provided, and I apologize, that's not the survey. The survey that was provided to our community over the, uh, back on June 12th, uh, what you'll see here is it takes into consideration the number of students who attended in elementary and junior high. What I can say is the, the numbers uh, were well spread out between both junior high school and elementary level. Um, the next question here took into consideration of immediate family members being immunocompromised. Uh, what we noticed there is basic, close to 85% um, of our community did not report that, whereas 15% did. Assuming some level of in-person operation at that time on, on June 12th, 80% of, uh, of our families would like to resume some type of precautions being put in place. Um, when we took a look at the green phase, options most comfortable. We had 10% of our parents indicating remote, close to 30% reporting uh, that hybrid, and then 62% looking at some type of traditional model. We have recognized over the past few weeks is that change um, that has come across the number of, of cases being reported. And for that reason, we are looking at, at starting in the, in the remote model. Um, elementary families, as the district operates in a hybrid model, looking at uh, different modes of reporting to school, whether they are alternate days or alternate weeks. Um, the information that is shared there uh, demonstrates that uh, they were flexible with either method, however, preferring a little bit more towards the alternate days. Similar types of results then at the senior high level uh, as well, secondary level. Um, being able to reopen, comfortable sending kids back on a full school bus was about a 50-50, and using a hybrid model was about 80-20 as far as that split there. Uh, being able to provide, willing and able to provide transportation to school was about a 50%, and when it came to face masks being required uh, by staff was about 50-50, and then also face masks being required for students was about a 60-40 in favor of not having students wear face masks at that time. Um, and then some other questions here that um, just talked about the sending your, your child to school without having a face mask or a shield. Uh, some were very comfortable, some were not comfortable with, with having students report. 
Again, this data going back to, to June 12th. Um, health screening, take a look at the health screening protocols. Uh, our families did indicate that uh, students should have some type of health screening prior to entering the schoolhouse. And then also that um, some types of screening should be taking place at home. And then when taking a look at the considerations of uh, what people took into consideration, much of this was in regard to um, student academics and, and falling behind academically. Uh, moving back to, to our plan in regard to the next phases, now as we look at, at these slides here, the language that you'll see up towards the top uh, that is given to us in, in these cases here indicates the specific language that is given to us from the state uh, indicating what is required in that health plan. Uh, cleaning and sanitizing, disinfecting, as we look to transition from a remote learning into a hybrid or into a traditional, these are the types of strategies that will be put in place to keep our children and our staff safe as they report to school. Those types of things would include um, a high level of, of cleaning high touch surfaces, disinfecting regularly, including uh, water stations, door handles, light switches, uh, basically moving through the building and being able to clean. Uh, we've purchased several electrostatic sprayers. These sprayers are able to, to cover large range of, of areas very quickly. We have an increased number of no-touch um, toilets as far as being able to flush and then also water filling stations with disposable cups. We would have additional circulation of outdoor air using HVAC and also uh, windows that can be opened safely uh, throughout our buildings. And then classrooms will also have disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer. So the disinfectant wipes would uh, be provided in each of those classrooms. It's basically, it's a, a barrel that has wipes that would be able to uh, be used for each student then to go through and clean their desks on a daily basis as they leave class. So as a new group of students come in, desks would be, would be cleaned and ready to go for the next group. Classroom learning space and occupancy allows for six feet separation. As we had mentioned, um, we cannot achieve a six foot distance in a traditional setting. A hybrid setting, we will be able to get to a six feet distance. The CDC recommends the six feet. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, came out with guidance for a three feet, uh, would reduce the exposure by 80%. We'll use distancing signs to control distance. We'll encourage parents to provide transportation. Uh, that will help with the number of students riding on our, on our school buses and movement will be staggered when possible to minimize the hallway traffic. And what we'll also do is we'll take a look at different areas of our, of our buildings. As students move through the hallways, we will take a look at some considerations such as one-way hallways, one-way staircases, and then also multiple exits from our, our cafeteria area. Taking a look at restricting the cafeteria, um, and other areas that have uh, large venues. Cafeteria, we looked and, and measured. We can fit a total of 250 students in there at six foot social distance. We would require to get more tables put in. Uh, our largest lunch at the secondary level is 220. Our elementary schools present a little bit more of a challenge. They're a little bit tighter spaces, but we would look for uh, other spaces to uh, provide lunch during the school day. We'll use direction arrows to help with the traffic flow. Um, students will be able to verbally share their PIN number so they don't have to touch the keypad. And then we would not have any assemblies, faculty meetings, or field trips uh, that would be scheduled in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, health and phys ed would occur in the outdoor environment as much as possible. Uh, same thing with recess, and then just also focus on fitness and wellness types of activities. In regard to hygiene practices for students and staff, uh, at the secondary level, which, as we indicated, the uh, sanitation stations will be set up throughout the building. Students will be encouraged at the secondary level to wash their hands regularly. The elementary level would look a little bit different where students can have a little bit more guidance where we can uh, schedule hand washing, uh, hand washing schedules and also washing prior to the serving of, of all meals and also snacks. Uh, at all levels, hand sanitizer, uh, hygiene and safety precautions reinforced in all content areas, which may look different for family consumer science, tech ed, art, music, different classrooms would have different types of levels of uh, precautionary steps that would be taken in place. 
and desks will be cleaned at, at the end of each period. Posting and signs, uh, we will have a variety of signs to be posted both in the schoolhouse and then also on our website. These signs will focus in on uh, promoting everyday protective measures, washing hands, wearing masks, keeping six foot distance, and how to prevent the, the spread of germs. Visitors at this time will not be permitted to enter our buildings. Uh, we will uh, have meetings that can occur in a face-to-face -face environment should we have uh, IEP meetings or any types of other meetings that require screenings uh, or that face-to-face -face environment. We will permit those meetings and then we will also use as much as possible any type of electronic signatures when permitted. Um, phys ed and resource and, and recess rather, uh, looking at outdoor when possible, that puts students into cohort groupings and going through and cleaning our equipment in between uh, uses. Monitoring students and staff for symptoms and history of exposure. Uh, that allows us to move through, take a look at individuals with any signs, symptoms, updates, uh, provide professional development to our staff to be able to uh, look for those types of signs. Individuals who are symptomatic will be instructed to stay home. Uh, we think that that's an extremely important aspect to do that pre-screening at home, uh, making sure that parents are able to see the signs and symptoms and in the event of any type of question, we recommend that, that students remain home. Keep in mind, while in any of our phases, whether it's remote, hybrid, or traditional, students will always have access to online content. So it should help students have, or help parents and students have the confidence that when they remain at home, they will have access uh, to curriculum. Uh, we will have automatic body temperature scanning as students enter each of our buildings. Um, any individuals exhibiting signs will be sent to the school nurse. Our school nurses are very well trained and will be able to uh, quickly assess students and make determinations of whether or not those simple symptoms are accurate and whether or not it would require um, isolation uh, in the schoolhouse and then contacting parents to have come pick the child up. Uh, readmission to school will require clearance from a physician and um, we will certainly always open up our, our continued communication with Allegheny County Health Department and also the CDC for uh, additional guidance as well. Students and staff at, at higher risk. For our staff, we have additional leave options that are available to protect staff members who are unable to report due to uh, medical conditions. Students at higher risk, and actually for all students in general, we will always have that ability to work remotely. Um, and then we will also have support for emotional uh, well-being, and these types of supports can occur in a live or a remote environment. Those services can be provided by the Allegheny County Health Network, that's through our chill room, Wesley Family Services, our school counselors, our school psychologists, and also school nurses as well, being able to help in that capacity in both an online and face-to-face uh, -face environment. Use of face coverings with the recent mandates uh, that have come out from the state. These guidelines align uh, with the recommendations that were made from the state level. And that requires everyone to have a mask on their person as they move through the building. Staff will wear a mask or a shield in the presence of students. All individuals will wear a mask or shield while moving uh, or less than six feet apart. So if they're in classes and they're seated and we're able to create that social distance, that would give us the opportunity to uh, remove masks and get some uh, some free uh, freer breathing that makes it a little bit easier for individuals to uh, interact uh, with teachers as well. Uh, any type of physical distancing outside, if we can achieve physical distancing outside, uh, not required to wear a face mask, and then naturally any health conditions of an individual who cannot wear a mask, or if we are working with individuals with hearing impairment, will not be required to wear a mask. However, shields will be provided uh, as an alternative. So as we move forward, our, our next steps, um, we will continue to monitor the local conditions throughout as, as we open up in the remote environment. We will continue to review those local conditions, continue to make decisions that are in the best interest of our staff and students. Uh, we will continue to receive feedback from health officials and from our local community. One of the components that we embedded into the e-blast that was sent out uh, last week was 
not necessarily a survey, but a, a Google link for our family members uh, to leave comments on any types of uh, concerns or any types of questions that they would have as we move through this process. Um, as we move through and we open up under the remote model, uh, we will provide additional communication in regard to what that remote model looks like. They're still uh, even opening up uh, in a remote environment requires significant amount of communication of what that looks like for individual students, um, what that will look like for our students who attend Parkway, um, and we will communicate that information in the next few weeks. So in the next few weeks, we will increase our communication model. Uh, the feedback that we received in the spring was that our communication model uh, was consistent, that it was very valuable, and we will get back into that model now that we have uh, designed and communicated our plans to, to uh, report back in an online environment. Um, and then we will consider taking additional surveys as we move forward uh, to take into consideration any of the, uh, any additional concerns or questions from, from our families and then also from our staff as well. So at this time, Mr. Shriver, I will turn it back over to you. I believe we will then open it up to public comment. Correct. Yeah. Do you want to have Mr. Jones? Yeah. Uh, yes, just, if I could, I just would like to thank uh, Dr. Kreider for that uh, report. I know this has been a crazy time and he and uh, the administration have been working very diligently to, to help get us through this and emphasize one thing that he had mentioned um, it, about reviewing in four and a half weeks. Um, we're not saying we're going to end remote in four and a half weeks, but rather after four and a half weeks, which is midway in the marking period, we'll be, we'll be looking at, the administration will be looking at uh, where we stand and at that point um, assess whether we need to continue remotely or whether we want to, uh, whether we're able to move into a hybrid or traditional approach because obviously that's, that's everybody's interest to, to try to do that. But uh, just so we're clear, this commitment to remote learning is not just for four and a half weeks. Uh, it could be longer. We're hoping it won't be, but um, we're going to see in four and a half weeks what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russos. So, uh, Dr. Craig, you want to have uh, Mr. Jones check the log and see if anyone's raising their hand to, to speak either on an agenda item or on the presentation you just made? Yeah, so I'm looking right now. Um, we have quite a few in the Q&A and we also have quite a few hands raised. I don't know uh, which ones you want to go with first, the Q&A or the hand raising, um, or if you wanna do them kind of in between or mixed, uh, up to you, Mr. President. Whichever, uh, Dr. Crowder, do you have a preference? No, Josh, I would say let's go with the people that have their hands raised to uh, to make comment there. Okay. <clears throat> and just a, um, a note for the individuals that I will be allowing to speak um, that have their hands raised. Uh, before you speak, just make sure that you state your name and uh, your address um, mm -hmm. so that can be entered into the record. Um, and we will, we will start with Nicole uh, McMurdo. And you are now unmuted and able to speak. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm not saying I disagree with any single thing, any plan that was uh, the presentation. My question is financially, we are a strapped district. How are we paying for the extra laptops and the extra, um, materials to clean and the changes to the building and everything that's covered and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it but are we getting help from the state or the government or anything to pay for any of this? Yes that's a very good question so thank you for asking that. I will turn things to uh, Mr. Juswick to address we did have two grants uh, that we have recently completed and then we also have the option for a third grant as well. Mr. Cheswick, would you like to share a little bit of information in regard to uh, the grants that have been filled out? 
Absolutely. Um, so where we were at, there were three grants that um, were released with this. The federal government released an Essers CARES grant where the district got around four hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars allocated. It was based on the title funds. Um, the state also released a PCCD safety grant, which used to be uh, more wrapped into school safety, uh, where you would make improvements to your building, you know, Raptor systems, um, more secure areas for entrances, um, vestibules, things such as that, signage. Um, what they did with that this year is they turned that into a COVID safety grant, essentially, for more products, uh, remote learning and such with that. Um, the original projection was 215, they 215,000 for our school district. It came out for about 175,000 with an additional $40,000 um, that we should to get later on in the school year once this this amount's expended um, and then we have an additional grant it's a Pima grant that one we're still working through is we're allowed to put cleaning products PPE supplies um, anything that really relates to getting the building ready to make a safe sanitary environment so with some of those funds you know we've made purchases um, We've been able to keep employees with those funds. We've been able to purchase PPE. We've been able to purchase laptops with that. A majority of these lap, actually all the laptops we bought, we've wrapped into this funding that, or Chromebooks, sorry. I always, uh, I drive our tech person crazy when I call them laptops, but our Chromebooks, we were able to purchase all, all this equipment through these grants. Um, and like I said, we did a ton of PPE. We bought machinery that will help uh, help our, maintenance and custodial crew um, clean the buildings in quick efficient fashions on a daily basis um, we have electro I believe it's electrostatic sprayers that we're uh, implementing in some of the locker rooms the nurses office um, masks gowns um, our school nurses gave us a list of equipment we've been able to purchase a majority of that so really we've really made a conscious effort to buy all this equipment and you know just to even jump into that our our custodial team and maintenance team um they have done a wonderful job for the district continuing to get these buildings ready cleaned keeping up on them and also like dr Kreider said we bought you know with other grants even we bought touchless water fountains we're buying cuts for those water fountains um with our cafeteria funding additional we're buying additional tables if we're back in school at some point to get more space for the kids and we've looked at other areas so we really wrapped up a ton of these expenditures in these grants also and as we continue to look for the best pricing to make it the safest possible environment for these children when they get back to get back to the buildings and for also the teachers we bought we bought face shields for all the kids district wide when they do come back because we figured that might be a little bit easier than a mask if we're able to do that also. So like I said, I, we've really wrapped a lot into these grants and to try to make the safest, most sanitary environment for the children, so. Thank you. Okay, right. just as a reminder, um, Please state your name and uh, your address before speaking. Um, and so we'll move on to our next uh, person, which is Ginger. Uh, and you are. Hi there. My name is. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, you are good to go. Okay. All right. My name is Ginger Heights. I live at 25 McMunn Avenue in Crafton. Uh, my question is about those students who once we do get the clearance to go back to hybrid and then even to um to full regular classrooms for those who are uncomfortable with that who may have immunocompromised children or family members and i know that the option is still going to be there to continue um just online but is it going to be the same teachers the same programs will they be switched to a different program or will they still be in the same classes with their classmates um, throughout the year even if they're unable to come back into the building or will they have to do something separate thank you that's a very good question and the current plan the way that would look is that they would remain uh, with their students that they are they, that they were previously grouped with in the classroom 
So if they were signed for a fourth period math class with a certain teacher, they would remain with that teacher and continue to re receive instruction from that teacher as well. Um, so that when that child is ready to make that transition back into the classroom, uh, they would join at the same rate, at the same pace. Uh, the strength of, of the program that we have in place, that this is, it's our, it's our Carlinton curriculum, it's our Carlinton teachers, um, and it's the Carlinton way of, of providing education to our students, which is it's student focused and uh, it's directed towards, towards our students. Um, so to answer your question, yes, they will be in the same class with the same teacher at the same pace with, with everybody else. Thank you. Could I pay you back one other question or is that, can I just ask one? We'll, we'll let you go one more. How's that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is probably more geared towards the elementary students. Will there be a grade book with this online learning? Um, in the spring, it was basically uh, student led. So parents really didn't have any idea of what, unless we're sitting there reading their emails and if they've already checked their emails and deleted them from the teachers, there was no way of us knowing what exactly was due and when. Will there be a parent portal so that we can follow along and make sure things are getting accomplished without having to sit there and, and make sure they're doing everything, you know, we're right there with them the entire time? While there won't necessarily be a, a parent portal into an actual grade book, what I can say is that the delivery of the online services will be much more robust than what it was in the, in the spring, is that uh, there will be greater opportunity for teachers to post assignments in advance, um, post expectations in advance, due dates, uh, to where I believe parents will be able to log in through their child's uh, Google Classroom and be able to extract that information to what assignments are coming up, what needs to be done. And uh, I think that will, will be definitely able to be able to provide that level of service for you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, our next one is Aaron Manifold. Um, Hi. Um, yes. Yes. My name is Aaron Manifold. Uh, I live at 415 and one half Center Avenue. It's funny. I had the exact same question as Ginger, but I kind of want to follow up with it a little bit. Um, so when the students do go to hybrid, if the parents aren't quite comfortable yet sending them, I heard that you you know they will remain with the students in the classroom group. Um, and they will continue to re continue to receive instruction. Will they? Will it be live instruction, or would it be like the, where they can stream into the classroom, or would it be um, pre-recorded lessons? Or like, will they get actual face-to-face -face time with the teacher and the classmates? That's a great follow-up question. And as we move through this process, we will develop more finer details to. Our plans. However, in this particular case, uh, in a hybrid model, as we would transition from remote into hybrid, uh, keep in mind the hybrid model runs for cohort of groups on Monday, Thursday, another group on Tuesday, Friday, leaving that time frame of Wednesday open for that face-to-face -face interaction remotely. Um, so students who elect to continue to receive remote instruction in the hybrid setting will still have the opportunity to interact directly with their teacher on Wednesday. However, the online coursework will be available. We'll continue to have pre-recorded lessons, uh, updated information throughout the week, and uh, we'll still have that opportunity to uh, have contact with teachers through, uh, through email and through other, other means of communication as well. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Our next one is going to be Deborah Sedekas. And you are good to speak now. Uh, Deborah, are you there? 
Looks like you're. Hello? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes, yes. can you hear us? Uh, well, let's, we'll move on. We'll come back to you, Deborah. <clears throat> Hello? Oh, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, we'll move on. We'll go back to Deborah. Uh, Cassandra Gibbs. Um, okay. Cassandra, um, you have an older version of Zoom, um, so you would need to re-download that um, in order to ask a question in this way. Uh, you could also use the Q&A feature and just type your question, and then I can read that at, uh, after we go through these uh, hand raises. Um, Dana Bannon, um, you are next, uh, and you have been permitted to speak. Okay, um, can you hear me? Uh, which one is this? <laughs> um, so I am on my husband's Zoom, so I'm Dana Bannon, but that's Chris okay. Bannon that you're seeing in okay. the photo. <laughs> um, I'm Dana Bannon, uh, 61 Dinsmore Avenue. Um, so my question, well, first, I want to just say thank you to the superintendent. Um, I know it's your first year, and this is quite a feat, and I do really like your plan um, in comparison to some other districts that I've been listening to through friends of mine. So I just wanna say thank you for having a flexible plan. I think that's a very great point of view being that it's hard to plan anything right now. Um, so as a working parent and in a two working parent home, I was just wondering when you decide to go into a hybrid model, um, when, how much notice you plan on giving parents when it comes to what days um, that our children will be in school because we have more than one child so we'll have multiple schools multiple days to worry about um, so planning will just be key for the working parent um, so just wondering how that will work um, for notifying us yeah that's that's a very good question as well and i think taking into consideration the uh the district's actions this evening is our attempts to provide parents and families with as much notice in advance as possible. Um, to give you an actual time frame to say when, it, that's, that, that's a difficult one because it is going to depend on the local conditions. Um, if we continue to see cases rise in the area, um, we're gonna use common sense uh, to, be, to be blatantly honest with you is to try to use as much common sense as possible. So the way you're probably reading the, the, the local environment is probably very similar to each of us reading that, that local environment as well. Uh, but we would try to give you as much notice because we recognize that uh, putting childcare plans in place is, is not an easy task. Um, but I don't necessarily know if I could commit to an actual time frame. Uh, but sure. we will make a commitment to, to do our best. Um, if I could just piggyback really quick, um, when, can you discuss if possible, and I don't know, I know this is a health and safety plan, so it's not necessarily an education plan. Will you be rolling, rolling out a separate education plan to give us more details into what the remote learning looks like? Um, will we be using something like, um, you know, an, an online platform that already exists, or are we doing like last year where it was pieced together through different websites and Google Classrooms. Um, again, if that's not something that's ready to be discussed now, that's fine, but when would we be discussing those? Absolutely, uh, we will continue to have, we will increase our, our mode of communication now between now and the beginning of the school year to help provide additional insight to not only we'll first start with, what will the remote environment look like and what will students and parents uh, need to do to prepare for that to get students ready but then we will also start to provide more details to uh, what the education looks like in the hybrid format as well um, and also dig a little bit deeper into what do the safety precautions look like when we get into the hybrid model um, how will we handle a, a child who is ill 
during the school day? How will we handle a teacher who becomes ill during the school day? What are our specific steps? Uh, those kind of things, you'll start to see a little bit more information on that. Maybe not all the, the finer details to it. Um, what does it look like when my child gets to school? At the elementary level, in many cases, um, they go into our auditoriums. We're not going to be able to house students in, in large groupings anymore. So that getting into school will look a little bit different. And I will use the opportunity in the online environment to prepare students for what that will look like also. Uh, so they do get a little bit more advanced notice and more comfort when they do report to school for the first time in knowing what that, what that school day will look like. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your answers. Thank you. We'll try back with um, Deborah again. Deborah, you are now able to speak. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you for coming back to me. And um, I'd like to start by saying thank you for making the decision not to open schools, um, at least with the four and a half weeks. Uh, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, I think Jer uh, Ginger and Aaron asked my first question about what the remote option will look like should we um, choose not to send our children back to school. But my other question was, um, again, just to clarify, first we're going to start remotely. We will phase into a hybrid model with the option for um, parents to choose to keep their children at home learning remotely and then phase into the traditional model. And my other question around that was, is could you just give us some insight on what factors will drive your decision on when we will move into these next phases? Yes, and we're not necessarily committed to moving into the, the hybrid step as, as an interim kind of step. It is very possible based on the, on the conditions that we jump from remote right into traditional. And uh, that'll be taking into consideration local factors such as um, number of cases on a daily basis, number of hospitalizations, numbers of deaths. We will also take into consideration the transmission and spread at the adolescent age. Uh, as we've recognized over the past few months, uh, when the virus first hit, it appeared to be affecting uh, individuals over the age of 75 to 80. Uh, as we've recognized in the past couple days are that the median age a few days back was 29. And so those are things that we're interested in looking as uh, schools start to come back in the south, uh, the southern area of the United States, in, in Texas, in Florida, uh, in Louisiana. Uh, we'll be monitoring that data as well. We are able to take a look at worldwide data, but we do recognize that United States is a different country in regard to um, moving freely. And I think that has an impact on what our data will look like in the United States, a little bit differently from worldwide data. Um, so there'll be multiple factors that we'll take into consideration. Okay, and if I could just add another question to that, would you consider sending out another survey perhaps when we're um, near the end of these first four and a half weeks? Will you take into consideration the parent and teacher feedback at that point as well? Yes, we will. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, it looks like we have um, Dana Bannon. I'm not sure um, if you had spoke already. I, I, I don't know if you had another question or. Um, I'm good. I answered oh. my question. You, you answered. Thank you, though. Okay, yep. Okay, Ken Loney, you are now able to talk. Um, you are muted currently, so if you want to unmute yourself to ask the question, but uh, you are good to go. 
Yeah, how you doing? My name's uh, Ken Loney. Uh, we're at 81 Thomas Street, uh, down in Crafton. Uh, I want to first off thank you guys for uh, all your work that you guys are doing. I did have uh, two questions. Um, my daughter's going from sixth to seventh grade. Um, we were just wondering when they were going to receive their class schedules and if there was going to be an on-site orientation anymore for this year. We do have uh, Mr. Lockard with us uh, online. I'll, I'll turn things over to him to answer when the, the scheduling will take place. And he and I also spoke briefly in regard to our plans for orientation. And uh, there will be plans for orientation, but I'll let Mr. Lockrin uh, share a little bit more information with that. And I believe his audio may not be working, so I'll answer it for him. Um, we will have plans to do a remote orientation. We will not do a face-to-face -face, uh, orientation. And I believe that uh, schedules will be coming out, I want to say the second week of August was the last time that we spoke. So students will still, they'll still receive their, their regular schedule. They'll know the names and the order of the teachers uh, that they go through. Um, and then we'll receive information as far as uh, what Mr. Lockren has planned are short video clips that will address different levels of concern. So it might be a two or three minute video about um, how to study online, a two or three minute video about how to, uh, how to interact with others online, and uh, two or three minutes just on study skills, entering seventh grade, course requirements. Um, so several types of things that he'll have uh, set up in, in small, small pieces. Thank you guys very much. You're very welcome. Okay, on to uh, Laura Lank. Uh, you are currently muted. We're good to, to speak now. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, this is Laura's husband, Aaron. We live at 619 Dick Street in Carnegie. Uh, I'd like to echo the gratitude everyone else has shared for the flexibility that you guys have uh, you know, considered with uh, you know, the plan to go back. Uh, and I uh, just had a quick clarifying uh, question and then a, another question. The first is uh, in terms of remote learning, you said it will always be an option. Does that mean for the entire year? It will be it will be an option until we make it into the clear and what clear looks like. Uh, not sure, but uh, as as long as we're under this health and safety plan, yes, learning from home will will continue to be an option. Great, thank you. Uh, and the the next question I had was, in terms of uh, the support that's given to the students, it looks like there's a lot in terms of uh, the school psychologist, the guidance counselor. Uh, if they need academic support, will there be any options for that? I know even learning some things just like the Common Core that we didn't necessarily learn, uh, we may need some support with that. Or even if parents have something that they can refer to, uh, you know, after working all day, sometimes it's, it's Googling the correct way to do something because we don't have the answers in front of us and how to do it. Uh, but is there any going to be any type of academic support if students are struggling in the remote environment? That's the piece that, that I admire about the board coming out with the decision early here is that provides us the opportunity to put more supports in place for individuals uh, and for students. Um, that I think as far as different levels, of what does tutoring look like in an online environment? I think those are things we can start to explore. Uh, through students in our National Honor Society, through different clubs and organizations, um, and also with uh, different types of groups to provide additional support to our students. So now that we have the time to move forward with a specific plan, um, I believe we will be able to put some unique types of uh, support systems in place for all of our students. All right, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Susie Pusker, you are, you're on. 
Hi, um, my name is Susie Pushkar. I live at One Coulter Street in Crofton. So I have um, two questions. One, and both kind of related to the same thing, um, and that's teacher professional development. So uh, teaching online is a completely different skill set in a lot of ways than teaching in the classroom. And so my question would be, what professional development has been done of teachers to date and what is planned between now and the start of the school year in order to ensure that the teachers are able to deliver an effective and high quality curriculum? And then the second question is, what are the mechanics of a hybrid model where a teacher is teaching to half of an in-person class and half students who are not in the same building as them? And how is a teacher expected to do both of those things at the same time? I'm sorry, the, the first part of your question again was related to what, I'm sorry. Uh, was related to teacher professional development. So okay. what, um, what professional development has been done for teachers to date and what will be done between now and the start of the school year in order to ensure that they're ready and, and prepared to be able to teach effectively online? Yeah, I think your questions hit on some important topics where you recognize that teaching online is much different than teaching in a face-to-face -face environment where it takes that personal interaction uh, between student and teacher. As we ended the school year, uh, this past year, we carved out additional time, as you, as you recognize, we ended the school year one week early. What that time did is it created additional time for uh, our teachers at the secondary level to pursue their Google certification, which if you look uh, online, there's a, a pathway for educators to move through to acquire additional skills uh, to become more adept at uh, online learning and also by using uh, Google Classroom. So our secondary teachers had that opportunity at the end of the school year to move and pursue that. Our, many of our teachers also asked, asked over the summer whether or not they could take their personal, the computers that have been issued to them throughout the school year to take them home with them as well to further refine their skills. In the past, we've collected those laptops, took them over the summer to update them for maintenance. Over the summer, our teachers have had the opportunity to, to further develop their lessons and become a little bit more comfortable with the online. Uh, we do have a little bit more work to go with our elementary teachers. They did not have the opportunity to go through, uh, and we didn't carve the time out. They looked more at learning gaps and curricular components at the end of the school year. Uh, at our last board meeting, we moved our January 20th professional development day uh, to August 17th and put in an additional professional development. That will provide us additional time to allow our, our uh, teachers to prepare for their online classroom. Um, part of the rationale for announcing early is not just for our families, <clears throat> but is also for our staff as well. Um, we recognize that teachers do have the summer vacation uh, but in many cases, our teachers take that time to go back and review it. And I think in this particular case, they will use this as an opportunity to further refine their skills. But we will have professional development put in place to, uh, to enhance their skills uh, prior to the beginning of the school year as well. And that will involve Google Classroom. Thank you. And so from the perspective of once we move to a, a hybrid model, and like the other parents I've spoken on the call, I really appreciate all the thought that's gone into this plan and the priority on student safety. But when we move into a hybrid model, are teachers going to be expected to teach to both an in-person classroom as well as a, a classroom of students or half the class of students who are online? Yes, they will. And that was the second part of your question. I apologize. Um, as far as being able to balance that, that creates the, the, another issue. As we move to hybrid, um, teachers still have a little bit more time than compared to a traditional model to be able to balance both face-to-face -face, um, and online. They will still, they'll have that Wednesday in the middle of the week to prepare all their online material and interact with, uh, with students at home. Um, so during the hybrid model, they still have that Wednesday time uh, to go through and, and refine and, and keep their online course updated and then also be available to students via email. Um, it becomes a challenge. If we move into a traditional setting, 
where we have 100, where we're asking for 100 percent of our students to come back into the building. We recognize that there's still going to be a potential population who is still not comfortable. Um, that creates a little bit more of a challenge <clears throat> that we need to further take a look at, to be honest with you, um, as far as how we create that time for our teachers to, to keep their online uh, courses uh, to that pace where we want it to be, where we want it to still be uh, interactive and we still want it to be meaningful learning for our students. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we have Rachel Ferrari Angle. <clears throat> you are now permitted to speak and you can unmute yourself. Fantastic. Um, my name is Rachel Ferrari I'm Angle. I live at 10 Walnut Street. Um, I just want to echo the sentiments of many of the speakers. Um, thank you for the common sense policy and approach and starting virtual. I think it makes a lot of sense as a way to gradually approach returning to the classroom. Um, one of the, some of my questions have been answered by previous people, but a, another question that had come up for me is if students, um, if we do continue with activities or sports, um, as some of those activities are looking at attempting to move forward, um, and we are at home, is there any kind of plan or way we could look into some kind of activity bus to get students, especially at the junior, senior high level, to some of those activities if you are a working parent um, and I can't physically get my kid to the school. I just was one, hoping maybe that could be considered. I will tell you that it is a consideration. However, we have not made a, a firm decision on uh, what that would look like or what the costs associated with that would be. Um, I know that the PIAA was meeting today to discuss what the fall athletic plan will look like. Uh, we have not heard any information in regard to, to what their plan will look like, uh, but we do recognize also that physical activity is good for our students. Uh, if we can support that in any way, um, we will consider looking at, at some type of transportation to provide to our students. Great. And then just kind of I wanted to piggyback a little bit on what um, was said previously um, about the teachers who are um, doing the online and hybrid in the classroom. I mean, I, I'm definitely just gonna say I have some concerns just about the well-being of our teachers and to be able to provide really good in-person instruction and online instruction at the same time. So as we move forward and when we get closer to that hybrid model, I think really taking the time to look at what that would look like um, for the teacher and the student um, um, and that we just really take our time to look at that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, Tiffany Watson, you are next. Um, you could you just unmute yourself. Uh, you are able, you'll be able to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, so I don't really have questions. I just have comments, really. Um, the first one would be, what about parents that work? Was that, I mean, if I have to go to work nine to five, but my son has to be home, to be taught like how's that gonna work that's one and then two we're pay the uh one thing that we pass every single day and we can't figure out is the the lights for the school are always on and the 15 mile per hour's on and we're not even in school so we could turn that off that's two and three if we can have sports for kids why can't we go to school Uh, so your, your 15 mile per hour sign, that is actually controlled by the local municipality. That is not controlled by uh, the school district. In Wonderful. Regard, uh, in regard to the um, athletics, we do have a separate athletics health and safety plan that is designed um, for the, the health, safety, and well-being of our athletes. The one thing that, the, uh, that we did take into consideration is that there's a distinct difference between outdoor athletics where social distancing can occur um, with the difference of putting children into classrooms where social distancing 
can or cannot be achieved depending on whether we run a hybrid or, uh, or a traditional model. So that was taken into consideration um, as well. And I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the, the third comment that you had. It was the work. I mean, we work. We're a two, we're a two parent household and eventually we're going to have to go back to work. So what happens to my third grader who cannot watch himself that needs to be at home for school? That does create a challenge for, for our parents. Um, and to say that I have a, a, a very clear answer for you, um, I don't. Uh, but it was something I know that the board did consider. Uh, we do have some of our board members who are working parents and do have younger children themselves, uh, which makes the decision making process a challenge for them as well. So then what's the answer? There isn't an answer. Okay, right. that's, that's it. That's, 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 that's what I share. I said there's not a real clear answer uh, to that. However, the board did take that into consideration. Will he be penalized if he has to miss days because he has to go somewhere else? Because I can't guarantee that his grandmother is going to be able to go through online school with him. No, I think the, uh, the value of, of, of the online, although this time we're going to attempt to make it more synchronous learning where it is occurring face-to-face -face interaction uh, with the computer. Um, However, there will also be opportunities to deal with it and, and complete the work in an asynchronous environment. But what I would ask is that if there are challenges, for example, uh, with your child, if they would be going to your mother's house or his grandmother's, um, if there is an issue with access to internet uh, or information such, or challenges and barriers such as that, we'd ask that you reach out to the school district and we do have plans in place where we could uh, help and provide assistance with internet connection in addition to providing the computer as well. Okay, I don't, yeah, I don't think it would be anything like that. I think it would be more of a, we work nine to five and there would be no one to monitor him. So like if, if I'm physically at work, which I know we can't be the only family that has this, who is going to sit at home with my eight-year-old because he cannot be in school? because face-to-face -face is better. And as, as I shared earlier, that's a, a specific answer that, that I don't have the answer for, to be honest with you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Lynn O'Hara. Um, if you just unmute yourself, you'll be able to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Lynn O'Hara and we reside at 221 Clearview Avenue here in Crafton. And my question um, tonight is for, with regards to the grading um, of our students. It was a pass fail for the um, last, nine weeks so my concern is how will the grading system be for the remote learning and for the hybrid is it going to be pass fail or will our children actually earn their marks good question as well as you've mentioned towards the end of the school year we did move to a pass fail at the elementary at the secondary we we did remain with our our regular marks um, we look to move forward due to the change in the delivering of instruction. We look to moving back to traditional grades at all levels, K through 12, uh, simply due to the nature is that we feel that we can create that online environment with uh, more face-to-face -face interaction with our students, um, more instructional activities in regard to uh, recordings. Um, and with that, we feel that we can get greater feedback from our students as well and provide more feedback uh, by keeping a, a traditional grading scale. I agree, okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, um, Cassandra Gibbs, uh, we can try again here. Um, you are unmuted and good to go. 
Okay, thank you. Sorry for the confusion earlier. Um, I have two questions, but first I want to thank you all for all of your hard work. I know it's you're not going to be able to customize everything for all of us, and we all have to make it through the best we can, but you guys did a fabulous job coming up with a plan. Um, my two questions, the one is the same one that's being piggybacked off of Ginger, Aaron, Deborah, and that aspect, um, as far as whenever you said that, you know, remote learning will be accessible all year regardless, is, are we able to um, customize it to children versus to family? Like, say, my high schoolers, hybrid, traditional is perfectly fine, but elementary level is not. Would that be okay or would it be like a kind of like a household thing? I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm sorry. So like, so what I'm saying is you, you said that um, online remote learning will be available all year um, for those who are uncomfortable. So with that being that option, is it a, you know, if one kid goes to, to the school, all of them need to go to the school or, hey, one can stay home and the other one goes to school? I understand your question now. Yes. Um, it, that would be differentiated down to the individual child. So say, for okay. example, your high school child is more comfortable going to school than what your elementary child, is that correct? Something of that nature? Correct, correct. We would treat them as two separate entities. The, the high school okay. child could still report to school uh, while the elementary child could remain at home and uh, receive services there. Okay, so I only have one, one other question, um, which is the reason for the first question. Um, I haven't heard or... If I did, you know, correct me, um, if there was any plan or plan being worked on for the special needs or the special service students, um, which was prompted my question originally, because I do have a, a special needs, special service child and um, who may not be able to follow, you know, the plans that are set as far as going back into school per se, but is there a plan being set up for them in the in that environment or you know um or is it has that just been thought about basically? It it, it has been thought about and that is a, a population of students that we're very concerned about in the online mm -hmm. setting. Um and that we are considering different types of accommodations um okay. for our students to stay specifically that we have that all ironed out. No, yeah. uh, but we have, we, that is something we have considered, yes. Okay, okay, so we'll, we, I, again, I, I heard you say you don't have that completely figured out now, which is fine, but we, we would, there would be some type of plan we would be made aware of at a later date? Yes, yes, if okay. we would, if, yes, if we would put something in place, you'll, we'll share that information out with our parents. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Okay, Aaron Manfold. Kim and the board, this is Bill Andrews. I just want to let you know that I could not get back on the um, my computer, so I, I have been listening on the uh, cell phone, and if you need me, you know, you can reach me from that standpoint. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Erin, you're good to speak. Okay, hi, this is Erin Manifold again, 415 and a half Center Avenue. Um, again, just echoing the gratitude because I, I do you know, value the common sense and just um, taking safety first. My quick question is, will there be an online um, kindergarten orientation? I have a daughter that's coming into kindergarten. Um, but most importantly, this is kind of piggybacking from um, a lot of people talking about the teachers um, having to kind of split themselves when we go to the hybrid model um, between the regular classroom instruction and maintaining an online environment. I'm a public school teacher for another district, and I know that, you know, maintaining the online was very challenging in and of itself. Um, you know, as you guys plan and problem solve, I mean, could you even consider having um, specific instructors for the online especially if you guys go back full traditional um i'm afraid that there wouldn't be equity for the kids that you know need to stay remote um because of you know immunocompromised family members or kids that want to stay remote because 
you know, their parents aren't comfortable. Um, so I don't know, just something that I think, you know, could it be considered that there would be uh, specific teachers devoted to, you know, live instruction for those students just in order to make it equitable for them? Yeah, let me answer your, your, your second question first, and then I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Bellman and Mrs. Burleson if, if they're able to, to, uh, to weigh in on the kindergarten orientation. Um, but to address the issue, that one of our concerns definitely is if we would move uh, to the traditional model, it does create much more time for teachers to stay focused on that face-to-face -face interaction with their students in the classroom. Um, that is a piece we'll have to measure. As we get closer to that time frame, we'll take a look at that. As a smaller district, we don't have the luxury as some of our larger districts in, in the area. Some of those districts are able to um, take four of their grade level teachers and have them work face to face with kids and leave uh, a fifth grade level teacher to work the online component only. If we get to a situation where um, we're in a traditional model and we are still at 60% of our students are attending and 40% are not attending. It is something that we can take a look at, um, not making any commitments, but it's possible at the elementary level, we could do it. The secondary level becomes a little bit more of a challenge because teachers teach um, multiple courses, which makes uh, certifications a little bit more of a challenge, but it is something that we will take a look at. If we're able to do it, I think we can, I think we'd be able to come to an agreement where we could get that done um, but if we're at a 85-15 split where 15% are still staying home, that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge uh, for that online content uh, to have a lot of those interactions back and forth with, with uh, students at home. Um, that's a challenge that we have to face. Um, the kindergarten registration, do we have one of our elementary uh, principals that would like to follow up with that? I can, Dr. Kreider. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Bachman, principal at Carnegie, I think Marsha might jump on after me, but um, so the answer to that question would be yes, we will have, we will do something with regards to orientation right now. Um, kindergarten, our main focus is still registration. I know that we do have um, a scheduled uh, registration dates for both Crafton and Carnegie. Crafton, I know, is July 28th. Carnegie's is July 29th, so we can get some solid numbers regarding our um, incoming kindergarten class and then once that's um, completed we can go ahead and um, get together our orientation. It's a little different than we've done in previous years because in previous years we didn't do an orientation in the summer because we had the kindergarten staggered start but because we're starting the year a little bit differently um, Kraft and Carnegie will have to get together and put together something um, virtually so we will do that. Yeah so yeah. Just, just to piggyback off of that um, same thing, Lauren and I try to keep it consistent with the two elementary buildings. So we are, that's in the works and more details to come about what that would look like for our kindergartners who will be coming in. Um, but if you do know neighbors, friends, let them know about the registration dates. Once we get all of the registration dates, we'll send a mailing out um, to give you more information on like orientation. Thank you so much. Okay, Rebecca Schaefer, uh, if you just unmute your microphone. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Rebecca Schaefer, and I'm at 209 7th Avenue in Carnegie. Um, I want to also thank you guys very much for, you know, everything you guys are doing, because I know it must be hard, you know, with being on that end of it. Um, I just had a few questions. Um, one, if you could follow up real fast on the remote learning. now. Is that because it's, it's not going to be it's like the teachers are actually going to speak with the children. Would they have more interaction with the teachers. Yes, that is our plan. But when you compare it to what we had in the spring, we are yes. expecting much more interaction with our teachers uh, with our students in that basically what we're having right now. I can see you. You can see me. Um, okay. Students would be able to see each other too um, with possibility of um, you know, being able to have more dialogue in the classroom, uh, more open conversations. Okay. And then the other one is, is 
is it going to be like also like because I'm worried about the fact that um, it being more like is there going to be more like hands on like or like for like especially like the elementary school kids like can they have like a workbook to go with it so they're like not losing their like handwriting and stuff like that because instead of just working on the computer itself. Uh, curricular issues, those are things that we will begin to consider in regard to uh, how we really plan that out in the online environment. Um, I know that we did discuss some types of supplies uh, that could be made available at home when we know that all of our students are home. Uh, would we be able to have some types of hands-on material available during, uh, we'll still have our, our meal distribution program. Uh, would we be able to uh, pass out materials at, at that time or be able to have things downloaded and printed for uh, okay. or manipulative based types of, of assignments? Yeah, because I was just worried about like academically, you know, for the hands on. And then um, another question is also to follow up with um, the like special needs children, like children that take like OT, speech, vision, things like that. Is that going to be more hands-on as well? Because back in the spring, it was not hands-on really. And it was like more like we took the place of like the speech teacher, the OT, the vision therapist, and um, they really weren't getting what they really needed. Okay. We'll use this as another opportunity to invite uh... Mrs. Hoffman in, uh, she was introduced at our last board meeting uh, mm -hmm. to the public. And uh, Sarah, if you could weigh in a little bit with the OT, PT types of services. Um, I know you've been working closely with some of our providers and if you could provide a little bit of insight with some progress that you've made so far. I don't think all of the answers have been ironed out to this point, uh, but Sarah, any updates that you would have? Yes, I did speak with our current provider for occupational and physical therapy as well as um, our partners with the IU for vision and hearing. And um, they will be going live uh, through Zoom or Google Hangouts, whichever we see is better. Um, that way they would reach out to schedule a session according to the student's IEP, if it's once a week, twice a week, and um, go from there. So they would be then they would be responsible for reporting um, on the student's progress. So what I did learn was that they uploaded um, in the spring that the providers did not go face to uh, live. So they uh, recorded and then uploaded a video. And then it was up to the parents to kind of go through with the kid and then report back on the goals. So we, are, we will be going live in the fall with everything. Okay. And then, I'm sorry, just one more quick question or a thing. Um, okay, I know that they're gonna limit to like the much on like on the spaces for the buses and stuff. Um, but with that being said, a lot of the children like, aren't being watched and you can't let the bus driver while they're driving to have to watch the children and with the fact of like with it still being maybe high risk as well um i mean because i'm probably i'm not going to be sending my child because of his high risk with things and his you know special needs but other children um if they have a mask on or they have to keep their mask on and they're not supposed to be like touching other children or fighting with other children and i've know that incidents have happened where these kids touch each other and hit each other and things have happened previously that's going to put the school more liable and more at risk is there going to be somebody else on that bus to watch these children we have a meeting uh this week with our new uh provider with with monarch transportation where we plan to discuss some of the details uh with transportation uh, in regard to bus drivers what their interactions will be uh looking at, at seats and assignments um, the more, more assistance we can get from our parents, I know it's a, it's a big ask that we're asking yep. in a lot of different things. Um, if we can get transportation from parents, that will help decrease the number yep. of students on our buses, uh, which will certainly help with different types of behaviors that, that you had mentioned there. Um, so in short, we do have, we have some plans to, to meet with our provider and, and work out some of those details. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand. I was just like also like worried with the school district itself, like, because we're putting a lot on also our teachers as well, because they have to pick up the extraness of not only do they have to do their job like they were before and watch the children, but now they got to watch for the risk of the the COVID and, you know, and stuff and 
and watch the children as well and with extra things so it's like putting the, the teachers more you know have more on to their weight on their shoulders so thank you very much okay thank you have a great day thank Bye. you okay uh, our next one is h rolston um so just make sure you say your name and in your uh, address before talking, but you are good to speak now. Good evening, my name is Hannah Olstein. I live at 526 Reamer Drive in Carnegie. Um, I guess I have one question. Um, we're a family of travelers. We usually travel during the school year. When I read through the plan earlier today, I did, and I might've missed it, but I didn't see um, where if we're traveling, are there restrictions when our children come back or um, business is normal, they just come back? At the present time, we are working with the guidance that's been provided by Pennsylvania in regard to traveling to hotspots. Um, if we have employees at this time who have traveled to hotspots, they are uh, required to go through the 14-day quarantine before entering back into the workplace. Uh, we would look to have the same type of procedure in place uh, for children. Uh, at that time, it's hard to say where the hotspots will be, if there will be any, um, after we move through September. But uh, we would look to continue to take guidance from, from PDE and then also from Department of Health. Okay, gotcha. So if we do travel to one of the states, I think it's 14 now that are on the list, they would be required to spend two weeks at home, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And then one other question for you, um, something I didn't think of and... Um, I thought about the other day and I thought it was super sad. Um, but when they do go back and I, I hope that we do go back, um, books, someone mentioned like they're not going to be able to touch books. Well, cause there's no proper way to sanitize them. Is that something that we thought of? Or is that something that I'm hearing is true? What about textbooks? Um, just regular books? I know my teach my backgrounds in teaching, I have a library full and you know, my kids always used my books. So is that something that's been thought of? Is that maybe something true? Or are we going to be looking at more like photocopying? Or I don't know, just just a weird question. That's no, okay. It's not a weird question. It, it is, it's partially touched on in the plan in regard to limiting the sharing of materials between students, uh, where we do look to have access to, even in the classroom, uh, more uh, activities. If something can be distributed by paper, if it can be distributed on the computer through uh, sharing by those means, we would look at it that way instead of passing out uh, papers to, to students. Um, textbooks, it's a textbook we would normally assign to students. We would continue to assign a textbook uh, to them that they could take home and use uh, during class. Uh, we would look at different types of things like library circulation uh, would be a little bit more of a challenge, but we do have procedures in place where we have the electrostatic sprayers uh, that are able to uh, spray down uh, equipment that is shared uh, between students. So whether or not it's uh, volleyballs, basketballs, manipulatives in a classroom, we can quarantine those materials and spray them down um, to a place where they're safe before redistributing to students again. Awesome. That gives me a little hope. Again, um, as I can echo everybody else, thank you guys so much for the time and effort you put in um, as a parent and, you know, a lifelong citizen here at Carnegie. I think you're all doing excellent. And uh, again, I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. We appreciate the feedback. Okay, uh, Mary Rose Grayson, you're up next. Uh, if you unmute your mic, you can speak. Uh, Mary Rose, are you there? Uh, we'll move on to the next one. We'll come back to you, Mary Rose. Uh, Jamie Harvey, 
you are next. Uh, if you just unmute your microphone, you'll be able to speak. Hello? Yes. Okay. I listed my question in the Q&A. I typed it in, but I can read it. My, um, oh, I'm sorry, I live at Re on Revere Road in Roslyn Farms. My question um, has to do with the type of instruction that will be given to the students during remote learning. Will the teachers be given guidelines for their remote learning instruction and lessons, such as the amount of time for instructional time, total teaching time that's live, total teaching time that is through video, homework, in, and independent practice? And during those remote and hybrid models, will the instruction follow the same curriculum map as it would during a traditional school year? Yeah, so the, uh, the curriculum mapping will definitely follow the same, the same curriculum that we have in place. That's the strength of the way that we designed this, and it's the, the Carlington curriculum as the Carlington teachers uh, with the Carlington expectation. Um, moving uh, beyond that, there will be guidelines in place in regard to um, having that face-to-face -face interaction with students. We did talk about the amount of time and the amount of work that we need to carefully monitor that. In some cases, uh, last year's feedback we received was that there was a significant amount of work being delivered from some teachers and from others there was not enough. Um, so we do want to take a look and make sure that we can balance those things out so that um, one, we're providing enough practice and routine uh, type of uh, activities for our children uh, at the same time without um, being overbearing with going too far with with uh, with expectations for our kids. Okay, thank you very much. I just, I mean, as we know, we were all thrown into it in the spring and expectations were different for every teacher. And I just want to make sure that my boys and all the students have the same expectations with the curriculum so that they are continuing to progress and we're not stagnant with remote and hybrid instruction. Right, and that's where we look to keep the, the, the hybrid and the remote to be at the same pace so that when uh, students rejoin uh, that they have the same exposure to, to the curriculum and, and the different types of activities. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for all your time and energy putting this together. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Jones, if I could, let me transition to some of the questions that we had typed in here, and that may uh, clear up some of the questions that we have uh, sitting and waiting off the side. Um, one of the questions uh, is related to uh, computer usage. If laptops are, are being used for distance learning, will they also be used in the classroom? And uh, yes, and we are looking at insurance policies uh, to protect the uh, computers as well, which information will follow uh, about that. Um, families will have the opportunity to remain at 100% remote throughout the whole process here. Um, moving through, indoor quality air is a, is a significant concern. Older circulation filtration systems, uh, what's the filtration system quality has been assessed for air quality. Um, we have had uh, overhauls with uh, much of our HVAC systems at the elementary level. And as far as that air circulation, we do have control. So we can uh, consistently control that airflow and increase it through the buildings to a degree that we are uh, very confident with. Um, children expected to report online specific class times, uh, parents work during the day. Uh, yes, we will have certain times carved out during the day where students are expected to uh, report to those classes when the, when the classroom teacher will be available. Um, what happens with kids whose parents work during the day? How will those students be able to log in on time? Um, that may have been one of the questions from earlier for the uh, parents who, or for the students who do have parents that, that work. Uh, those are some strategies we can put in place as far as uh, management of time at home, being able to help students recognize uh, online learning techniques uh, as well. Um, can parents have another Google Classroom training? Yes. Uh, where can we find information on cyber options uh, for this district? We'll have those posted online. Um, the buses, how they're going to work. We do have a meeting with our contractor coming up. 
Uh, but as we said before, the more parents we can get to, to help out with providing transportation, that will decrease the number of students on the bus. Um, the hybrid model has been decided how it will be structured. Uh, yes, it will be two days a week. We'll have a cohort of students uh, reporting on Mondays and Thursdays and a cohort of students reporting on Tuesdays and Fridays, leaving Wednesday open for uh, remote learning. Um, elementary, single parent home expected to attend live online classrooms. The parent works during the day. I believe that's a, a duplicated. Um, they will have the opportunity to log on live and also will have the opportunity after that live classroom instruction to continue their, their coursework uh, when parents get home as well. Um, comment to, uh, to thank the board for the courageous decision. Uh, also like to remind the public, uh, it's a biological event. It's not the fault of the district. We certainly recognize that. Um, and we, we, we appreciate the, that input. Um, could the district look into childcare options uh, like the Boys or Girls Club? It was something that we had talked briefly about. Uh, however, there are uh, several challenges that get in the way of that coming to fruition. Um, Family First Coronavirus Response Act with the families. We can look to share that. Again, more information that comes out from the federal government, we can go through and, and we can share. Um, Cafeteria staff will be starting and what to expect. We'll get that information out to our cafeteria staff when, when those plans become available. Um, hybrid model goes up to whole families on the same day it will be broken up. Um, when we release the hybrid model, it will go in place for everyone all at once. Um, reiterating thanks uh, to the district. Um, engage in, in uh, continued communication and anything that that family can do is, is willing to help and support. So we thank that family. Um, eighth and twelfth, eighth and twelfth grader have be determined who goes what days. Um, we did take a look at uh, during the hybrid model. If you do have uh, two children at home, we would try to get those by alphabet, uh, being on the same days. So if you have the same household, looking at kids going on Monday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday, so that it helps with your household. If you have students in your household with two last names we will be flexible to work with those individual families to put those families on the same schedule if that's desired. Um, will the teachers be given guidelines for remote learning? I believe that question was, was asked already. Um, and I believe that, that covers all the questions that were, that were in the Q&A. Uh, back to you, Mr. Jones. And if you, uh, people asking questions, if there was a, a repetition in a question, we ask that uh, you respect others' times here um, as to not repeat those questions, um, but we will continue to answer questions here. Yes, and if, if one of those questions were answered, you can always just lower your hand uh, and then we won't call on you. Our next one is Greg Vetter. And uh, Greg, if you unmute your microphone, you'll be able to speak at this time. Hi, this is Katie Vetter, uh, Greg's wife. We live at 828 Library Avenue in Carnegie. Um, just real quick, I just want to make a comment that as you guys refine your hybrid model, that you keep families with multiple children in the school system in mind and um, keep them on the same schedule. Uh, because I think for us with four kids in the district, it might be a nightmare if they're all on different days. It would be it would be a nightmare, and that is something I just covered there with the the Q and A. Uh, we would work with with families if everyone in the family has the same last name. That will work. If they don't have the same last name, and you would like to make it work, we'll make it work for you. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Deborah Klein, you're next. If you unmute your microphone, you'll be able to speak. Deborah, if you're still there, if you just unmute uh, your microphone, you will be able to speak at this time.
Okay, Deborah, we'll come back to you and we'll move on to our next um, Julie. I'm going to mess up your last name. So, Julie, um, you're next. Uh, you can unmute yourself. This, this oh. It's Mahalsik, and this is uh, her husband, Luke Mahalsik. We're at 62 Kingston. And my, my question is um, based off of the survey, when you had mentioned parents comfortable or okay with sending their kids back, I forget what the exact percentage was. But considering the survey, uh, I'm wondering why you chose the most conservative approach. I love the flexibility. I like that there's multiple options. Um, and even options, regardless of what the school district does, parents can choose to stay fully online if they want. I'm just wondering why the most conservative approach was chosen, considering the survey was the opposite, you know, it was, I think it was 60% said they were ready. I forget what the exact number was. Yeah, you're right. That, that's a fair question. When you take a look at the data and you take a look at the plan, do they align with each other? No, not necessarily uh, based on the feedback that we received. Um, following the survey, we did receive additional informal feedback, several phone calls and additional emails that came in. Um, parents asking if they could change uh, the results of their survey that they wish that they would have been able to answer differently in light of the, the current conditions. Um, so to answer that question is the rationale for moving to the more conservative approach is just based on the most recent data that we are receiving at the local level with the number of cases um, that are coming up. Because you're right, back on June 12th um, and prior to that, I think my attitude also was a little bit more open to getting kids back into the, into the schoolhouse a lot sooner. Um, but I think at this point, based on the, the current climate, um, the district decided to move with a little bit more conservative approach with that end goal in mind uh, to get kids back into the schoolhouse safely. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And you are on. Hi, uh, Ann Gargis, 88 East Steuben Street. Um, I just wanted to ask about a cyber option. I believe that the district has one. I haven't heard us talk about it at all yet. Yes, we do have, we have a cyber option um, that right now, the reason that we're not talking about it is because we feel that the cyber option that we will be able to offer in the face-to-face -face environment with our teachers and our curriculum, uh, we feel is a much stronger model than what we currently have with the, with the online cyber. So that's the rationale for, for not bringing that up. However, we can make uh, information available to individual parents who would uh, be interested in pursuing that direction. Yeah, I mean, I think if we are gonna go 100% remote, even if it's just for the beginning, parents should have that option. It would seem to me that, um, seeing that we operated that way, those teachers already have certification, they're already used to um, teaching that way. We, we should be talking about that as an option for parents. Uh, like I said, if, if there are parents who are interested in, in going with the, uh, the Cyber Academy approach, uh, we can certainly walk parents uh, through that. Um, that model is, not nearly as interactive as what we plan on ours being, to be honest with you. That's why we haven't uh, thrown that out there as, as, a, as a real option. Um, the cyber academy that we have in place is uh, more, well, it is, it, it's asynchronous learning where learning uh, is at the pace of individual children. There's not much interaction between the teacher, if any uh, interaction at all in a face-to-face -face environment than online. That's honestly why we haven't thrown that out there because we think this model is stronger. Okay, I am one of the parents that are interested in it and I believe I sent you an email on it um, earlier this week and then I was also referred to Ed Mantich and I can't seem to find him anywhere on the Carlington directory so if somebody wouldn't mind just jotting down that I'm interested in it would like to be connected to the resources 
and then do that as a follow-up. I would really appreciate it. Okay. And then uh, just to double check, I, I responded to your email, correct? I, I, I don't believe I saw that. I can check again. Okay. It must have been a different one then. Um, yes. Um, Mrs. Harmon, if you could make sure that you have the, uh, the name captured here that we can make sure we get back to, to this parent then. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, Aaron, may the last, last question here, right? Yeah, we have, yeah. Uh, Aaron, uh, you are good to talk if you unmute your microphone. You know what, I had no further questions. I'm sorry, I must have never lowered my hand. Thank you for answering all my questions. Not a problem, thank you. Okay, um, I think we answered all the Q&A, or not we, but uh, Dr. Friday answered all the Q&A questions, and I do not see, oh, I take that back. But, well, no, okay. Um, <clears throat> it looks like we don't have any more raised hands, um, so uh, I'll turn it back to you guys. Well, good, thank you, Mr. Jones. And uh, part of the process here with going through this, uh, this platform was to provide the opportunity for our families and community members to ask questions. We greatly appreciate the number of people who joined us tonight. It's a big number, we like to see that. Um, it gives us the feedback that we have uh, a community that cares about the manner in which we deliver instruction to our students. The questions were on target, they were very good. Um, there are still more questions that will be out there, I'm sure. Uh, we do have the online platform available. The link will still be available for uh, parents to leave comments on tonight's presentation. We will make tonight's presentation as far as the PowerPoint available online uh, for those who want to take a closer look at it. Quite honestly, uh, it mirrors very closely the health and safety plan uh, as is. At this time, uh, again, thank you to everyone for joining us. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Schreiber. That's my superintendent's report for this evening. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Kreider. And thank you for the public for sharing your questions, your concerns, appreciate everybody's attitude and, and support of district's plans, it's not perfect, but we're, uh, we hope we're going in the right direction. So thank you. Um, Dr. Kreider, any administrative reports or anything from your business manager on the finance? No, we thought we'd push information. We expected this to be a little bit longer, so we're gonna push that to the next meeting. Understood. We'll move on then under section four finance, I'll entertain a motion to approve four items. Number one, the treasurer's report for the month of June 2020 as submitted. Number two, the authorization for ESL services for the 2020-2021 school year as provided by the Allegheny Intermediate Unit. Uh, number three, the athletic fund report for the month ending June 2020 in the amount of $4,920.50. And then number four, the activities fund report for the month ending June 2020 in the amount of 88 $8,888.20. So I have a motion for those four items. I so move. Second. Thank you, moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries, thank you. Um, under section five personnel, um, Dr. Kreider, are we, are we going to consider this tonight? Or are we going to postpone this for a future meeting? I believe that is something that we decided to postpone for a future meeting. Okay, very good. Uh, moving on to section six then, student services. I'll entertain a motion to approve two items. Uh, number one, the Carlington School District Health and Safety Plan as submitted. And then number two, the revisions to the Carlington School District Athletic Health and Safety Plan as submitted. I have a motion for those two items. Second. second. Move and second, thank you. Any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, opposed nay? Motion carries, thank you. Um, under section seven, old business, any director have any old business they would like to bring up? Not we'll move to new business. Any director have any new business they'd like to discuss? 
If not, we'll go back to the public for open forum. Anyone in the public have any final questions? We do have one uh, hand raised at this time. Um, so, uh, Deborah Klein, um, you are recognized at this time. If you unmute your microphone, you can speak. Okay, she removed her uh, up hand or her raised hand. So I'm gonna assume that means that she does not have a question any longer. Uh, back to you. Okay. Um, any board member have any open forum items they'd like to discuss? I, I just have a comment. I, I wanted to thank all the public and all the families that participated in our watching tonight. I wanted to let everyone know, a lot of people talked to me leading up to this meeting. And so, you know, us making this really tough decision, like it's hard on me as just one person to try and make decisions for everybody. So everyone that emailed me, texted me, stopped me on the street, I carried all of your comments into our meetings and that's, you guys are part of the process and that's what brought us here. And it's so hard because there's no 100% um, perfect answer that works for everybody. But the biggest thing that weighs on me is like safety first. Cause we could say like, oh, only one student got sick or one student died. It's like, what if that was my son? Yes, yeah, just one student, but that was my son. So we take this very seriously and it's, it's really hard getting on the details, but it really helped hearing from everyone. We took that survey seriously. And I think somebody asked about, are we gonna do ongoing surveys? Absolutely, because that's the thing that's helping drive our decision-making along with experts and the recent data from the state and the county. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate hearing everybody speak tonight and email and participate. Good point, thank you. Any other director of any comments or questions? I will quickly note um, a quick thanks to Director Frank and a uh, big thanks to Director Mendoza. Uh, the treasurer's position is, is being passed, the baton is being passed from Director Mendoza to Director Frank. Marisa, thank you very much for your service for the last couple of years. The board has appreciated all your efforts on keeping us on point on the finances and hopefully you've trained Jude in a way that will keep him in the same in the same direction. So I thank you both. I Jude what this job is and he's all excited. So go for it, Jude. Perfect. Thank you both, appreciate it. And, and one quick plug for uh, Jude. Jude formerly uh, held the PSBA liaison position. So if anyone else has an interest in taking that up for Jude, he's gonna be dropping that as he moves into the treasurer's role. So we'll try to fill that position in, in August, in our August meeting. Any other final questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Hey, so we're going to get a link for executive session, or would you use the old one? Uh, That's a good question, Joe. And while we're while we're addressing that, um, we will go back into exec session. Thank you. We, we talked about it earlier, but to address potential litigation, contract negotiations, um, personnel, and real estate issues. So thank you, Dr. Apple.